Warm welcome to all of you. Um, we have over 800 people who have registered for this webinar. So thank you so much for your interest and thanks so much for joining us today. We have an absolute stellar uh, 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 setup uh, of people who are going to be telling us about the really um, gruesome situation of what our migratory birds are leaving. Um, so um, as you heard, I'm Patricia Sorita, I'm the Chief Executive of BirdLife International. And for those of you who don't know us, we are an extraordinary family of over 115 organizations working around the world, uh, saving birds, but using birds as the best ambassador to protect the rest of nature. Uh, we have here today, and it is my immense pleasure to introduce a wonderful panel of people uh, from all three sides of the world. So we have Asia, with Yatun with Yat Yu, uh, we have um, the Mediterranean with Mark and Nicholas, and we have the Americas with Brand and Leon. Um, we're going to start with uh, Badend. Uh, Badend leads our flyways program um, and has been working with BirdLife from um, uh, 2013. Um, since 2016, he's been the global coordinator of the flyways program uh, that brings together the work of all the, the partners um, of bird life uh, through the migratory flyways. Um, today, uh, Baden will introduce us the issue of illegal killing of migratory birds and why stopping this is an incredibly important priority, not only for bird life, but for all of us. Uh, right after that, uh, I'll, we'll move into Yatung, but I will introduce him uh, once uh, Baden has finished. So let me pass it on um, and thank you so much for joining us again. Good morning, uh, afternoon and evening. Um, I hope my slide is showing well. My name is Barend van Gemeren. As Patricia said, I'm the coordinator of BirdLife's Global Flyways Program. And it's my honor to introduce you a little bit the world of illegal killing. It's not a fun story we're gonna tell, but trust me, there's some light at the end. Um, why is this? Okay, so um, we already, as humanity, we already managed to hunt a number of species to extinction. So we had the dodo, we had the great arc, and we started off killing them in such large number that they went extinct. But those were flightless birds restricted to islands. So, but we also did it to the passenger pigeon, which was once the most abundant species in North America that migrated in huge flocks. By 1866, there were as many as three to five billion birds around, and it went extinct due to hunting in 1914. And I'm, I'm sorry to say, but we seem to be doing it again, this time with yellow-breasted bunting. It was uh, once the most and widespread of the songbirds in the Paleartic, and it has dropped with uh, more than 90% in, in four decades, and it's now critically endangered. Um, so that's, hunting is a worrying issue, especially for migratory birds as they move between countries and continents. So for them to complete their journey, they need to have safe passage in all these countries. So that becomes a shared responsibility. And actually the, 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 the disappearance of, of the passenger pigeon and other species led to, to a lot of international collaboration and um, and one of the, the things that resulted from that is sort of a shared responsibility, international collaboration and, and treaties, conventions to help protect migratory birds. So one of them is the Convention of Migratory Species, which is very powerful, but there are other conventions and partnerships around. So what works, a treaty is fine, but it does, it's not the whole story. What you need to have is international coordination an agreement, and then you need to make sure that governments actually follow through and take the action at national level. And for that, you need active civil society. And you also need that it translates the good plans into underground conservation action. If all pieces come together, it is possible to save migratory birds. A good example of that is the Blackface Spoon Bill, which through international collaboration, increased its population from 288 in the 80s to nearly 5,000 at present. And that's in a remarkable recovery. Um, but what if, what if all the great plans 
are not respected? What are rules broken deliberately or just ignored? What if criminal minds use what we see as our shared responsibility and jeopardize something beautiful like the migration of migratory birds? Um, that is a real problem. And that's the problem we're discussing today. We're discussing um, the big issue of, of illegal activities and how that affects migratory birds, especially the killing, the trapping, and the poisoning of migratory birds. So migratory birds, there are about 2,000 of them. 17% is already globally threatened of near threatened. That means those birds are too close to the brink for our comfort. And they're often facing multiple threats. But the second biggest threat is hunting and trapping. 53% of the globally threatened and near threatened migratory bird species, for them, hunting and trapping is a serious threat. And, and keep in mind that these, as these uh, birds journey, sometimes as far away as 10,000 kilometers on a single stretch, um, that they need to overcome multiple threats. So, so think about climate change. Climate change can be devastating for migratory birds, especially long distance migratory birds, because the cues for birds to, mi to start migrating might no longer be aligned with the moment there's food abundance, for example, for their chicks. So the scope of the killing. So we don't really know how much illegal killing is going on in the world. What we do know is that everywhere we looked into the issue, we have seen horrible numbers of birds being killed. So we've done review of, of Europe, the Mediterranean, we started, then we added the, the Northern Europe and the Caucasus, and recently we completed the um, Arabian Peninsula, Iran and Iraq. And if you combine these figures, it's really scary. So 25 million birds are illegally killed or taken every year in the Mediterranean region plus uh, the rest of Europe. And then another 3.2 million are annually killed, trapped uh, in, in um, Iran, Iraq, and the Arabian Peninsula. And that 3.2 million is surely an underestimation because large parts of countries or even complete countries were not included yet. So those figures must be really high. And also we started a, a, an assessment of uh, illegal activities in Southeast Asia, and the preliminary results show that more than 200 species are victims of illegal activity. So it's huge. Um, so the method, I'm, I apologize for these horrible pictures, but this is the reality of, um, of illegal killing. Um, so we have traps, we have guns, we have lime sticks, we have nets, and we have poison. And all of them, are uh, affecting migratory birds. They're crude and they're often um, leading to a horrible, painful death for the birds involved. And, a, and another problem with the, the, the methods is that they are non-selective. That it means that any bird passing a kill zone will, uh, can, get, uh, can get affected. So also they're highly, already highly endangered species. So why are people involved in these like, illegal activity. So partly it's food, and traditionally it used to be a lot of food, and traditionally they were sort of the hunting was aligned with what could the population could sustain. But increasingly over years there's a shift that other reasons for illegal activities are, are there. So sport and recreation is a new one for pet trades, for predator control, and for data contests. And uh, just to mention two things here. So the delicatess, you need to keep in mind, it sounds really fun, but there's, especially in, in the southern part of Europe and the central part of Europe, it's linked to organized crime. There's a lot of money to be made from these, uh, these poor birds on a, on a plate. And I also want to mention that for sport and recreation, you see the picture of Lebanon with the storks being killed. And there's a sort of, there's a strange um, influence of social media putting in place a sort of competition between uh, poachers to show how many birds they can kill. They're for no further reason than for gun practice. So the good news is it's not all doom and gloom. The Bird Life Partnership is there. As Patricia said, we're a partnership of national organizations. We're spread out. Um, and we work together to protect birds uh, and the habitats we depend on and that we humans depend on. 
Um, the good thing is about bird life partners is they're all rooted in, social, in, in, in their societies. So they know what needs to be done and how to achieve it best. So that's a, a really strong thing. So bird life partners are positioned along all major flyways. So that means that anywhere a bird is going, they will at least find a few friendly faces to help them. The bird life partners work on the things that need to be solved nationally, and we team up to address things internationally. BirdLife is recognized for its expertise also in science and policy, that allows us to influence the international uh, nature conservation debate. So um, migratory birds are really a good way to connect people to nature. And the two things I really want to share with you, you might want to check it. I hope that uh, Sarah can share the links later on. The one is the flight for survival. That's in the, within the African Eurasian Flyways currently a, a awareness campaign. And it's a sort of one-stop shop for everything that's happening on illegal killing um, in the region. It has great stories. It also has um, shout outs from partners who need help. For instance, if you want, need to sign, if they want you to sign a petition to help convince their government, as is currently taking place in uh, Cyprus. And there are also fun stories like on the Egyptian vulture. The other thing you really need to check out is the BirdLife magazine, especially the latest issue, which is all about migratory birds, nearly all about migratory birds. And you can get a free trial issue. And it also features uh, uh, an article about the fly away game, which is a sort of fun, um, playful way to educate people about migratory birds in Asia. Um, so as Patricia has already said, we'll have three talks today that talk about the actions for migratory birds. They come from different regions, showing how different uh, situations are approached differently. I will not mention them again in the sake of time, but you, I'm really convinced you will be impressed by the, by the, the enthusiasm and the sort of the dedication and the, and the professionalism of the speakers uh, who will be telling about their daily work. I just want to mention that um, stopping illegal killing isn't easy. It's something for the long run. We need to do a lot of things, have a lot of things in place. So we need to have insiders what's happening in the field. We need to make sure that governments strengthen regulations, ensure that regulations are then enforced. And we, at the same time, equally important is we need to change attitudes of people towards nature. And we need to get people, and especially young people, to speak up for migratory birds. Now, for all of that, we need to have the skills and capacity for conservation. I'm saying this because we really need your support. Um, we have currently achieved good developments in many places, and there's opportunities elsewhere. And in many of, uh, of these places, it was bird life action that led to the current situation. It's now essential for us to press on and scale up our actions. And for that, we just simply need support to be continue. So we already, as you can see from the logos, we have a wide range of sponsors and donors. We also may, I would also like to, um, to ask you to consider making a donation while you listen to the wonderful talks of the people after me um, to, to strengthen our work. Um, I hope Sarah will share the link to the appeal we're currently running, running to stop uh, illegal killing of birds. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Badend. Uh, that was incredibly comprehensive and um, incredibly sad as well. But as you said, there's light at the end of the tunnel and the bird left partners are here for the fight and we want to change the fate of these amazing birds. Uh, so we want to pass on the baton to Asia. Uh, you Tung, uh, yeah, Tung Yung, uh, is the senior research manager at the Hong Kong World Watching Society, the bird eye partner in Hong Kong SAR. Um, Yatun coordinates uh, the regional work that led to the incredible recovery of the blackface boom bill that you heard from Badend in Asia. Today, he's going to tell us a little bit about another threatened species, the yellow-breasted bunting, and how can we get it off the menu uh, in Hong Kong. So take it on, Yatun, and thank you so much for joining us at this late time in Hong Kong. Uh, thank you, Patricia. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, yes, I, I'm Yatung Yu uh, from the Hong Kong Birching Society, but live in Hong Kong. 
Uh, I am very delighted to have this opportunity uh, to share my experience, our experience on uh, stop illegal killing uh, birds in, in this region, in, in my place. So yes, um, I would try, yeah, start my PowerPoint first. Yeah, I'm going to share with you of our uh, work, uh, working experience about the uh, uh, yellow-breasted bunting. Uh, yeah, we mentioned that yellow-breasted bunting is a, a highly uh, crit critically endangered species now. Uh, okay, uh, first, just need to show you some background information. From here, from the pictures here, you could see actually yellow-breasted buntings are really, really beautiful birds. The male one is really cracking. And then you will be, you will be, I'm told, wow, actually you will be amazed uh, to see the male one in the field. And also actually the female is also quite uh, attractive. You see the bright uh, yellow color. Well, when every time I saw them, yeah, I just feel very happy. Of course, the story behind is also more amazing. And, it also, from this PowerPoint, uh, it also show you some information about this species. Uh, from here, you can see the global distribution. Uh, you can see the breeding range of this species actually cover a very big area uh, from the Europe to the Russian Far East. And then you also need to notice uh, how small the uh, East Wintering Ground could be. Actually, it means to me that most of, most of the birds actually concentrate uh, in a very small area in the Southeast Asia region and also South China region. So they are always uh, stay in the flock. Uh, it may give some problem for them uh, to face the problem, uh, to face the face of the uh, illegal hunting. Uh, then I also need to tell you about uh, some uh, background about uh, uh, the bird protection in Hong Kong. Uh, fortunately in Hong Kong, uh, all the birds are uh, legally protected uh, under the Hong Kong law. Uh, so we, we, we usually do not have uh, any big problem of illegal hunting uh, because possession of uh, trapping device are actually uh, legal, uh, actually illegal in, in Hong Kong. So uh, we don't have this kind of problem uh, locally, but the problem is that uh, the traditionally uh, our uh, people uh, like to consume wildlife meat some of these wildlife meat actually could be smuggled uh, illegally, uh, could, uh, smuggled to, to Hong Kong uh, through different uh, uh, channels, uh, well, those land transport or even by ship or whatever. So it happened uh, when we have problem uh, with this um, uh, illegal smuggling uh, wildlife meat. Okay, so I also need to tell you a bit, uh, a, a story about the yellow breasted bunting in Hong Kong. Uh, from here, actually, uh, I just tried, I just do the screen capture of a TV program. That TV program actually has been uh, approached us, approached my office uh, to talk about uh, the problem of a yellow breasted bunting. Uh, at first, it is a very good way for us to promote this species. And then when they do this program, they actually lead to interview uh, the restaurant. Well, you could see a gentleman here. Uh, he's the owner of the restaurant. And then uh, you may, you may have a little bit difficulty to see that some numbers uh, on some figures and character because it is in Chinese. But you will see this restaurant has a very long history in Hong Kong. Actually, this gentleman, the owner, told us uh, how long the history uh, they have with the yellow breast but yellow breasted bunting on their menu in the past. Uh, he mentioned about that uh, in about uh, uh, last, last century, uh, 1916 or uh, 1970s. Yet they still serve yellow breast bunting on table uh, on that time. And yes, um, the local people or the South China people uh, actually have uh, this kind of history to consume the yellow breast bunting. So you could see from the pictures here, um, they could have different way to cook it. And I could tell you uh, this actually, uh, uh, the, the picture on the left, the one with the, uh, uh, the barbecue one, uh, the one on the left with a uh, different series of a, uh, uh, of the uh, stacks of the uh, yellow breasted bunting. This actually, this bring me my story, uh, bring me my memory about that because I remember when I was young, I actually asked my parents to buy some of them for me because on that time, people say this is very delicious. Yes, uh, sorry, I, 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 I confess that I, I had a feel before, but yes, it is also my, um, uh, my, my reason to work on this business now. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, in Hong Kong, many uh, old people could 
still remember Yellow Breast of Bunten because of this kind of the uh, history and this kind of the tradition. They always think they always think having Yellow Breast of Bunten is probably uh, one of the best delicacy in autumn. So uh, and then it just come in cheap price and then they could afford it and they think uh, this is uh, tasty. So this kind of the tradition, uh, yeah, could still be yeah, could still be remembered by the old people. But the situation has been changed uh, since then, uh, since uh, mid 1990s. Uh, wow, well, when I grow up and then when I stop bird watching, I stop eating more wildlife, and then I I didn't pay attention too much about the yellow breasted bunting uh, in the market. But also on that time, uh, I I actually uh, could feel the people consume on the yellow breasted bunting actually are getting fewer and fewer. That is good sign. This is good sign. And I need to tell you about the other story with the uh, uh, with the uh, people uh, working in the restaurant. Uh, these two gentlemen uh, actually uh, come from the uh, is a, a same family. Uh, the um, the one on the right with the hat is uh, the father, and then the young one is uh, the, the uh, is his son. Actually, um, the father also told us uh, they like the yellow breasted bunting very much, and they actually opened the restaurant. The father also tell me, tell us, uh, told us about that. He he missed he missed the yellow bunting, <laughs> yellow breasted bunting very much, and then luckily, uh, the story comes as his son also loved bird watching, also loved bird photography. Now his son uh, helped him to take care about his restaurant. His restaurant is very famous to promote the traditional uh, Hong Kong food. And he, well, they didn't, they didn't mention they want to put this species on the menu, but now they, they say it because from the inference from his son, they say, they actually, they told, they told us uh, directly to us and also in the TV program, they say, well, they would not put the yellow breasted bunting in the menu at all because they always say now uh, yellow breasted bunting should be in the wild, should be in the field, not on the table. So this is a very good one for us uh, to, to talk about this kind of story to all the public in Hong Kong. And then actually we feel a dilemma to promote uh, this, uh, the, the conservation of this species because when we promote this species, we don't want to see uh, to increase or stimulate the people uh, to have this kind of the delicacy anymore. So when we do the promotion, we actually need to uh, change a little bit on the direction of that. So we need to promote uh, the awareness of this species. Uh, we need to promote such a, a, a cool image of the yellow breasted bunting. We want the young people to be attracted by this beautiful bird, and then they will have this kind of uh, 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 feeling to love them. Uh, we hope that we don't need to tell them the answer. And then the answer is, please don't eat the bunting anymore. So we hope we could do it in Hong Kong and in uh, from now and in the future. And then the situation actually is still happening. And we find, and also uh, uh, the finding has been summarized in this uh, recently published paper. Uh, we find the hunting of the bunting has been, be, has been shifted or have been changed uh, from the last 10 years. And uh, in, uh, you could see from this screen, uh, from the slide, uh, you see some uh, orange spot and the red, red spot in the map. What it means that uh, the orange spot uh, is the way, uh, is, the is the place they find uh, the yellow breast abundance has been trapped. And the red spot is the new one. The orange spot is the old one. So you could see the trapping event actually is now shifting uh, from the south, southern China to the northern China. And then we also find we also record several cases uh, of this uh, of this illegal hunting. It still evolve about a thousand birds. Uh, so we still worry about the future of this hunting. And then you can see the poster here. This is the what what we do uh, for the China uh, uh, with the China uh, bird watchers in China try to promote the awareness of this species. And also we we want to deliver a message here. Uh, perhaps you couldn't understand the Chinese character, but for the, the, the meaning of this poster is, yeah, if you're still eating uh, the uh, yellow breasted bunting, yeah, with chopsticks, definitely, because in China, and then you, this will be the last one you could, you could see. So we deliver this poster uh, to all over China. Uh, we want to also uh, to, uh, die, uh, to, 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 to pass this message to uh, all the public uh, uh, as well. 
And yes, situation is still happening, and but we still can find some birds have been trapped and then keep for a while, and then the birds has been uh, fattened by the artificial fattening agent, and then we find that uh, when yeah they got the birds, they kill the birds, and then they just. Uh, uh, transport the meat from the North China to the South China. Yeah, because I just say it, uh, yeah, eating yellow breasted bunting is some kind of the tradition uh, for the South China people. So uh, we still hope to stop this. Uh, we still want to uh, uh, to stop this uh, illegal hunting uh, as much as possible. Uh, so we are trying to, um, to work with those uh, people in China. So I use this slide uh, to uh, for the con uh, for the conclusion of, of my of my presentation. So in Hong Kong, we also do the uh, the study of this birds because we need to combine both scientific background and also our public awareness material to further strengthen uh, the people uh, about uh, the, the the awareness of this species. So yes, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to hear any question from you. And yeah, thank you. Good night. Uh, good good afternoon. That was great. Um, Yatun, thank you so much. And it is fantastic to see the work that Hong Kong Bird Watching Society is doing. Uh, it is about convincing people that birds are not only cute, but incredibly necessary for our well being in the future. Um, so, you guys are doing a spectacular job. Thank you so much. And there are already questions coming. I want to I just want, before we pass on the, 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 the baton to um, the Mediterranean, I just wanted to mention. We have so many of you from all over the world. Thank you so much for joining us from the US, from South Africa, from Lebanon, Morocco, Djibouti, Canada, Egypt, the UAE, Brazil, Singapore, India, Slovakia, Bulgaria, from all over. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's lovely to have you all. For those of you who joined a little bit late, uh, the chat function is disabled. If you have questions for the panelists, just use the Q&A, please. Um, it is my immense pleasure to pass on um, the floor to uh, Mark Sultana, not only an um, extraordinary CEO of a bird life partner in Malta, but a dear friend. Um, and Mark will be presently presenting jointly with uh, Nicholas Barbara, um, Ber uh, who is the bird life Malta head of conservation. Um, both these gentlemen have an incredible track record when it comes to fighting illegal hunting of migratory birds. And there's a, there's a wonderful comment already on the Q&A from Emmanuel. Thank you so much. These guys are heroes, no question about it. Um, today, they're going to talk about finch, finch, finch trapping, sorry, and illegal hunting, uh, two of the in, very important areas of work of BirdLife Malta. Uh, Mark and Nicholas, take it on. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you, Patricia. It's, it's an honor and a pleasure for us to, to be with all the participants. I can see now we're over 250, which is awesome. And um, so we can start immediately uh, with sharing our presentation. And um, just because we have a lot to say, I just go ahead and uh, start explaining. First of all, Malta is in the center of the Mediterranean. We have, okay. So let's start. Bird Life Malta is an organization rather old for a country like ours since 1962. We have uh, an amount of history where we've seen Malta change a lot drastically. And we have a lot of things which we can boast about. However, I think for the sake of this presentation, we have to focus on the illegal killing, which is a sad story. And um, But as Baron said, there is a, a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. As I said, in the middle of the Mediterranean, a small archipelago of islands, very densely populated, the highest uh, densely built up country in the European Union with 33% of our land built up. We have 10,600 10, hunters and 5,000 trappers and um, with five months of hunting during, uh, during autumn and some weeks in spring. And I want to say at this point that Although we do speak with, about illegal hunting, we need to keep in mind that anything that is legal does not necessarily make it morally right or ethically right. Because it's very easy for a country to reduce its illegal killing by making species legal or activity legal. So we need to also understand that sometimes we have to fight against uh, the issues related with what is being made legal in countries like ours. And this is the sad truth. We have people who hunt birds. The photo that you're seeing on the left for taxidermy. So you have 
birds of prey, harriers, montacoos, pallid, marsh harriers, you have purple herons, igris, you have also a cormorant. It is a sad sight, but is this is unfortunately why most people would hunt a protected bird. On the right, you have a linnet, a songbird, a finch, which is being kept in captivity for its for the rest of its life. So what do we do? How do we handle this scenario? Basically, and this is what Nicholas will be discussing with you, uh, it is the monitoring in the field. So we have to be present outside, collecting data, monitoring what is happening, both from a migration point of view, but also the activities related to hunting and trapping. And then we also aid a lot the law enforcement, both because we have collected evidence, but also because we have the experience and we need to push the enforcers in Malta to take action. With this information, then we have to raise awareness, to engage with people. We do this mainly through the media and on social platforms. And of course, then the other part, which is very, very important, we have to advocate, we have to lobby, both in a local context and also at EU level. And from here on, I will leave uh, Nicolas to explain to you the rest of the presentation. Thanks, Mark. Um, uh... As, as, as Baran has mentioned earlier, there is also the, the study, which puts Malta a bit into perspective. And although we are a small island, and, and in terms of the numbers of birds killed, we are not the, the worst in the Mediterranean region, which is quite bad overall. But when it comes to density, um, practically we are the most intense uh, black spot of illegal killing um, in the Mediterranean. And this is due to, as Mark explained earlier, the density also and the, the high concentration of hunters um, on our island. Um, as, as also Mark mentioned, unfortunately, uh, hunting is very popular. It's quite a big proportion of the population who practices it. And as a result, governments over the years have tweaked the legislation to allow quite a lot of hunting going on. We practically have only three months in the year where there is absolutely no hunting at all. And Malta is one of the only country in the EU that also applies a spring hunting derogation that allows birds to be hunted while they're migrating in spring. And on top of that, we've got uh, the excuse uh, of wild rabbit hunting in summer months, and then the trapping, as we will show you shortly, um, of species, which is also one of a very unselective method um, of catching and killing wild birds. And this is the typical scenario one would find on our islands, uh, very compartmentalized agricultural land, uh, which is tweaked for hunting purposes. You can see their eucalypt trees, which grow very fast and attract turtle doves, which is why they are grown. Um, high hunting towers, as you can see, there's a couple of hunters on those towers there. Uh, so all, all our countryside, basically, what remains of it is morphed for the illegal killing. Uh, this is a typical coastline, a natural 2000 site, protected for its, its unique habitats. Um, and what you see, those uh, small, squarish, um, uh, cleared out land is basically trapping sites. Those are used to place clap nets, in this case, for the strapping of finches, of songbirds, which is a very popular uh, pastime with trappers. So how do we, how do we uh, counter it in the field? Um, one of the methodologies that we have developed over the years, which is very effective, is basically going up in the air and seeing these very, very clear areas where the nets are laid down. We collect this information and map it out uh, digitally so that we can share it also with enforcement authorities. And then obviously, then we have to ground truth and go ourselves on the various sites and get police basically to, to uh, to confiscate these nets and to act. And the end result, most of the time, is a lot of finches, uh, protected finches, are being confiscated and then passed on to us uh, to be able to rehabilitate and release. Um, when it comes to legal killing, now for quite a number of years, we've been running our volunteer camps, unfortunately a bit hindered with the COVID situation at the moment, uh, where basically we are joined by a number of volunteers from all over Europe, but especially also from the UK, uh, who all come with us for uh, peak migration periods in spring and also in autumn, because we're seeing birds, uh, we're in the middle of, of, of the Euro European African Asian flyway. Um, we organize a, a few weeks every spring and autumn where these volunteers come and join us in the field um, with the objective of actually catching and documenting the illegal killing. Um, so that is a typical uh, scenario that we have where we want to get 
the actual identity of the person and the act of committing the illegal killing to be able to then report to police for, for action. Um, one of the aspects that uh, as an organization in Malta, we are a constant reference for members of the public is obviously with the, all the illegal killing that's happening, there's a lot of injured beds that are actually encountered. Um, and over the years, we have become a, a center point for, for people to bring us beds um, and we collaborate with the government authorities also in order to ensure that these beds are diagnosed, rehabilitated. And as of recently also, um, of recent years, we are now set up to actually rehabilitate these beds and we are getting better at it. Um, so any, this is a March carrier that, that was released uh, some, some, some months ago and also uh, flamingos, any kind of bears actually uh, that are not just shot, but also have other problems. Okay, um, so, so Nick explained exactly what we do in the field. It's of course more uh, wide than, than what we could offer in these few minutes. Um, however, we have to also raise awareness and push the government to take the right decisions. We do it mainly by using the media. Uh, constantly, um, uh, we are lucky to have a very good communication setup, and um, where we also have a lot of respect from the media themselves. This is, for example, Nicholas actually showing uh, a shot turtled up in front of the law courts, and um, just before we entered to actually start taking legal action um, on uh, on issues related to hunting and trapping. Local pressure, definitely something which we are continuously doing. I can't say that we're always listened to. Um, unfortunately, there is this perception that hunters have a strong lobby with votes and most of the politicians, with all due respect to them, really care about votes sometimes rather than the benefit and the goodwill and the good, the benefit of the good for, for all the community. And this is something that is, a, for example, it's a protest that we held in front of the parliament and we spoke to all the members of parliament, including the prime minister, um, with the sign saying, do not be afraid from those that break the law. Um, then we also push with the European Union because our country is part of the EU and has uh, commitments and obligations to safeguard birds in particular during uh, spring. And th this is a case in point where we are now managing, we have seen recently in December, the EU uh, starting infringement proceedings now over the hunting and trapping situation. Needless to say, um, we're very small, everybody, everybody knows everyone over here, and it's very easy to, to fall into the trap of bec becoming intimidated. We've had cars vandalized, we've had cars being burnt. These are volunteers who are doing some studies in Busquet. It is also a bird sanctuary, um, and, and it goes on. We also had serious issues where even bird life people were threatened um, just by simply um, help, uh, helping out the police. So we do have successes though. Yes, and uh, our work, especially on, on as Mark mentioned, uh, involves a lot questioning what is actually legal. So uh, one of the things that we have faced and, and uh, we, we are still battling is actually whether hunting in spring was legal at all. And, and one of the breakthroughs that we had recently was that turtle dove now is illegal to kill during the spring season, although we still have issues with the spring season, but at least this is one of our recent successes. And in 2018, after government tried to also bring back the trapping of finches, the unselective trapping of finches, um, uh, we helped with our lobbying and also with the evidence collected in the field. Uh, we helped the European Commission actually press on uh, with a European Court of Justice case, and it actually concluded that the practice should stop uh, on, on Malta. Um, and obviously, all the evidence that we are collecting in the field are helping out uh, to some high profile cases on the islands um, where we actually document the evidence and help out police. So anything uh, that is rare and uh, beautiful in terms of, of migratory birds from eagles to flamingos um, and these sorts of, of, of species are hunted illegally. And we, we, we do uh, make it a point that we're out there in the field to be able to monitor the illegalities. And sometimes they make enough success to become frontline headlines uh, on the island. So um, we'll be sharing with you a very short few seconds video just to actually conclude our presentation. It will give you an idea exactly 
of uh, what we have uh, in, our, in our country. And then we'll, then we'll end up with a few thank yous, which I, I, I feel we have to, uh, for all the help that we receive. Okay, 15th of September, we're in the Dirt there's, Tower. There's more. Just filming Marsh Harris just about to take off. It's all. Oh, we can hear shots. <gasps> it's down, it's been shot. <laughs> yes, I'm recording him. It's hanging. Yeah. So now we will start releasing all the birds. Okay, yeah. Uh, today we're releasing six birds back into the wild, five common kestrels and one merlin. Unfortunately, all of these birds suffered from gunshot injuries when they were trying to make their migration in the south from their breeding grounds in the north. And secondly, we'd also like to thank the public who have also become members and also donated to us, which allows us to carry out this vital work. And if you would like to support us and help us do this work in the future, please consider becoming a member or make a donation as well. And you can do this by visiting our website, which is www.birdlifemalta.org. Thank you. So back to you, Patricia. But before I do, if I may, I want to thank the BirdLife Partnership. Definitely without the partnership, most of the work we do would be double the, the, double the effort. Um, a lot of funders as well within the partnership, VBN, NABU, RSVB, many, many others. Uh, and I also want to thank all the partners and the Secretary of the um, Europe and Central Asia of BirdLife. They also helped us to push the European Commission to take action against Malta in a joint letter, which was amazing to see all the signatures of all the partners in one letter. And of course, Oak Foundation, Marvel Foundation have helped us during the years. And finally, anyone out there individually we really um, appreciate it's not just the monetary thing which is also very very important but also the motivation and inspiration that we get from you guys so thank you very much and um, back to you Patricia. thank you mark i'm glad that it's it's you know seeing those shots is devastating but you guys are as i said at the beginning you guys are heroes uh, and we'll keep vouching to make sure that things um keep moving in the right direction all right let's move to the americas and uh, it is my immense pleasure to introduce you uh, to uh, Brad Andres from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He's the national coordinator of the U.S. Shorebird Conservation Partnership. He has traveled the world to protect migratory birds and their habitats. Um, Brad will present jointly with Leon Moore. Leon is a former soldier and now considered by many as one of the most knowledgeable birding and naturalist guides in Guyana. His love for birds has led him to, on the path to nature conservation. Today, Brad and Leon will talk about the unregulated harvest of shorebirds along the America's Atlantic Flyway and specifically the situation in Guyana. Um, I'm so happy that we have people from my region coming in. Um, Brad and Leon, take it on. Thank you so much for joining us. All right. Us. So we are moving into the Americas and we'd like to have a focus on the harvest of shorebirds in the Atlantic uh, Americas flyway. I'll start off with kind of an overview of the region uh, that, that we'll be addressing and then Leon will focus uh, particular, particularly on Guyana. <clears throat> so shorebird hunting has been practiced by a European colonists in the Caribbean and Northern South America since the uh, mid uh, 1600s. So pretty soon after colonization, uh, Europeans brought the hunting tradition uh, with them. <clears throat> and it's uh, only been more recently where we've really started to take notice of, of what may be going on uh, relative to shorebirds. There's been some signals uh, both in, in uh, monitoring data we have for this species, for example, the lesser yellow legs, which is a Tringa uh, sandpiper, and also some preliminary work uh, that was conducted by partners in Barbados that, that kind of indicated uh, how, how prevalent uh, lesser yellow legs uh, was in the harvest there. 
And so because of the, these signals, we, we put together a group that we're calling the, Sh the Shorebird Harvest Working Group, which is part of the Atlantic Flyway Shorebird Initiative, uh, to really address uh, the sustainability uh, of, of shorebird harvest, again, in the Caribbean and Northern South America. And uh, the one thing when we're dealing with these multinational um, uh, jurisdictions, protection levels uh, vary quite widely. So we've been talking a lot about uh, illegal uh, harvest, but also then on Malta where there have been, you know, some regulations put in place that to allow uh, legal harvest. And if you know, North America has a long history of, of managing um, and harvesting uh, species, particularly waterfowl. Um, and so if we look at the jurisdictions where we believe shorebird harvest uh, was significant, or at least we undertook studies to try to get to that assessment, um, is we find that uh, shorebirds are fully protected in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Suriname, and Brazil. Uh, then there's kind of a second tier where uh, what, what we term is partially protected. And these are primarily the overseas departments uh, and territories of France, and then also Barbados, Barbados. So what I mean by that are these are the jurisdictions that have either bag limits for the number of shorebirds that can be harvested and also have season restrictions. And so we get to one country that we're gonna focus on later and that's Guyana um, where there's actually no uh, restrictions at all. So you can uh, harvest shorebirds year round in any numbers you would like. So we have kind of the full range uh, that we're trying to deal with and with uh, the partners and the countries within this region. So what's interesting though, is with, uh, if we look at this, this kind of range of protection, we find that the, the actual harvest doesn't necessarily relate to the degree of protection. And so Trinidad, again, fully protected and, and from recent work, we think harvest is very minimal in Trinidad and Tobago. And then we kind of have this second level with about five to 15,000 shorebirds taken annually. Uh, and again, these, uh, this really falls in, in these areas that, that again, set seasons or uh, have bag limits, like the overseas departments of France, Barbados, and then Brazil, which again, um, from the uh, other side of the slide there is, is uh, fully protected for shorebirds there. And then uh, Guyana, which we uh, mentioned there, I mentioned that, uh, you know, there's no protection at all. Uh, so the recent work just uh, about a month old, we're estimating between 15,000 and 50,000 shorebirds are harvested in Guyana, primarily in the fall, which again, Leon will, will address in detail. And then the big one here is Suriname. And so some preliminary work there is Suriname has really the bulk of the harvest in, in this region. And Suriname, it, it's uh, again, uh, completely illegal to harvest shorebirds of any, any type. And so because of this uh, variability and protection and also what's happening in the harvest, we need to really think about a lot of different strategies across this region. We always get, you know, the question when, when I've given talks on this of, well, which species are being harvested? We talked about yellow legs. Um, this is probably the, the number one species that's harvested throughout the region, um, both in the Caribbean and on the coast of Northern South America, particularly in Suriname. Um, and then also you may be surprised, but these uh, small, smaller sandpipers like semi-palmated sandpiper, that's a caledra species, are harvested in pretty high numbers in Northern South America. And again, this is uh, Leon will address uh, this coming up. So with that kind of background on, on what the harvest scenario or situation is, I like uh, other speakers here, I definitely want to talk about some real positive steps forward um, that we've had by working collaboratively um, across the, uh, the jurisdictions in this region. And I want to first start with the uh, French overseas departments. Um, 
since we formed that working group in let's say around 2013 is there's been a, an increased number of protected species uh, in the in all the uh, the French overseas departments so French Guiana Guadeloupe and Martinique um, also there have been a daily and seasonal bag limits uh, set for a number of species and again in Martinique and Guadeloupe uh, some of those restrictions uh, that Guadeloupe uh, put in place, and if you know, for some of you may know the French system, uh, there are associations of hunters called uh, feder hunting federations who recommend uh, what these uh, regulations should be that then are approved by the, the French hunting agency. And uh, with these restrictions, again, they were put forward by the hunters. There's been a 27% reduction in hunting days, which from some information we have has really led to uh, a low, much lower harvest. The other thing that uh, happened in Guadeloupe and, and uh, San Martin is the development of a shorebird network. So to engage both the, the agency and NGOs, as well as the hunters in, in a more open dialogue um, about shorebirds in general, and then also about the, the uh, hunting, hunting regulations. The one thing that, that we developed uh, was actually an MOU between the French, Canadian, and USA uh, hunting agencies to, to work collaboratively on trying to address the sustainability of the harvest. So trying to provide each other with technical assistance on thinking about regulations and, the, and scenarios for regulations, and then also working on the science to try to get uh, good estimates of, of what the harvest really is. One thing I wanna mention uh, again, along these lines of collaboration is prior to 2017, uh, French Guiana did not issue hunting license for any species, whether it was tapers, or um, or birds, and so again, with uh, working with us and with the uh, the initiative of our partners there, we they now have in place a hunter training um, program that, and then to receive a license, you actually have to take a test and pass a test, uh, and and it's something we do in in the U.S. as well of of trying to really educate um, hunters to be ethical hunters. Uh, another great thing that, that's happening in French Guiana is the uh, government, the agency, the Conservatoire du Littoral, uh, is, is purchasing uh, former rice holders or rice fields uh, to then make into a protected area for shorebirds as well as other waterbird species. Um, so again, this is a, an effort to provide some, some areas of, of no, no shooting uh, refugia for shorebirds and other migratory birds. Uh, turning to Barbados, again, Barbados has a, a very long history of, uh, of hunting uh, water birds, uh, shorebirds and waterfowl primarily. And what we've seen in the uh, last several decades is a, a real decline in the number of active shooting swamps. These are essentially um, private organized clubs um, that they get together to basically to have um, to hunt on on weekends primarily. And so we've really seen a drop at that, and I'll mention why in a few minutes, but kind of coupled with that then too, is a real decrease in harvest from the, the late 80s and into the 90s to now. So it's been halved and, and even moving towards only about a third of what was harvested just 20 years ago. So some real changes happening in Barbados. And the changes in Barbados are, are completely um, due to voluntary harvest restrictions by the hunters. There's very little government oversight. Um, so it, it really has been the hunters kind of seeing uh, what was happening in other places in the flyway that said, no, you know, we need to, we need to really think hard about, about keeping this sustainable and making sure that the, that the birds, um, that we do have birds in the future. There are, besides these kind of internal factors, uh, there's a lot of external factors, uh, both politically, politically and through societal change, uh, just in a drop of interest in, in that, that hunting tradition. And then also uh, more stricter gun policy and things like ammunition scarcity have kind of um, 
put some external pressure on these changes as well. The one thing that, that's interesting in Barbados is these um, active shooting swamps did provide a lot of wetland habitat for birds for most of the year. The hunting season really only extended for about two months. So for eight months of the year, there were opportunities uh, for birds to use these wetlands. So one of the things that's happening as um, as the shooting swamps decrease as we're trying to figure out ways to maintain these wetlands uh, for birds. So really turning them into uh, no shooting uh, reserves. And so that's a, an ongoing effort and something bird life has been involved with um, over the years. Lastly, I wanna mention uh, just some the work in Suriname, if you recall, this is a real uh, hot spot for harvest. And so we've had problems working with the government with just transition over the last couple of years. But just as of last week, we finally see some light at the end of the tunnel to re-engage uh, on issues of hunter education and law enforcement. And so again, the whole idea there is, is to teach the, the folks about what's legal, what's not legal. And there are uh, some animals that are legally taken in Suriname, just not migratory shorebirds. So trying to make that distinction and then getting a little bit more law enforcement uh, presence on, on the ground. Uh, we've done some preliminary work in Brazil uh, to assess the shorebird harvest there uh, along the north coast. And there will be follow-up work uh, by BirdLife and other partners to, uh, to kind of continue that work to get a better idea on, on the social context uh, for hunting in Brazil. And just as uh, I believe Baron showed the slide of all the partners in BirdLife, we've had a lot of partners working on this issue. Uh, again, the NGOs, agencies, um, that are trying to come together to to really um, to make this harvest sustainable where it's legal and to stop the harvest uh, or res you know restrict the harvest where it is illegal. So with that, uh, Leon, I'll pass it over to you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Brad. Um, good morning, good evening. Uh, coming to you from from Guyana, it's on the northeastern shoulders of Venezuela. And we run the topic of, you know, shorebird hunting. Um, I've been working on shorebird uh, surveys and monitoring uh, since 2017. And shorebirds estimate abundance harvest on beaches and commercial selling compared to work in, done in the 2000s. Uh, Guyana, obviously, the country is 83,000, about 83,000 square miles. The population is about 750,000 people, which 90% of the population lives on the coast, 10% um, uh, of Guyana's land area. The area in red on the first slide, uh, that is where we've been conducting all of the surveys since 2017 to now. Uh, capturing and killing commercial selling of migratory shorebirds. It is legal, as Brad mentioned in his presentation. Um, and we would like to change that really fast. Uh, some of the methods that they've been hunting these birds, as you can see in the image below, uh, there's a guy standing there. He has a wire and is tying a pole perpendicular to him. And as the birds come, that's how they're, they're killing the birds. Also, that, that method is referred to as shocking. Um, there's no electricity involved, it's just the wire and when the bird makes contact with the wire and the guy is pulling on it, that kills the birds. Um, also, the recent survey that was conducted uh, last year, I found people using mist nets. So that's another method uh, people are using these, people are using to capture birds. And as you can see in the image, lots of plovers and yellow legs, um, which the guys are hunting. Use of harvest shorebirds uh, in the late August to mid-November, that's a period when the majority of, of birds are, are hunted. Uh, all shorebirds are consumed. Uh, for personal use, selling on 
selling to the local restaurants, which includes some of the Chinese restaurants here as well. Uh, commercial selling on the weekends of the market, particularly on Saturdays. Um, and then below is image of, you know, birds that, again, being killed. Uh, small sandpipers, plovers are most often sold at about seven and a half dollars US to 20 US for 20 to 25 birds. Um, and then the larger uh, shorebirds, the yellow legs, large plovers uh, frequently goes from about 10 US to for 12 birds uh, for about 20, 20 US dollars for four birds. Next slide. Uh, and in the shocking beaches, uh, east and west, compared to 2002 to uh, 2017. However, preliminary estimate of annual harvest likely between 18,000 to 40,000 shorebirds. And then our next, our next step is to develop an outreach project to educate communities about shorebirds, uh, migration and conservation. Also to increase engagement with the Ghana Wildlife Conservation and Management Commission and Environment. And finally, to identify IBA for shorebirds. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much, Leon. And it's so sad to see these shock wires, my lord. I can only imagine birds and shorebirds flying with those uh, wires coming up. Um, and as you said, uh, mis uh, misnets are also the favorite uh, tool for many uh, hunters and trappers around the world. So it's um, really sad. But thanks for all your hard work. And it's great to see that it's actually coming down. All right. So we have excellent questions on your Q and A on the Q and A box, and what I have, I'm gonna, I have done is bulk them together um, to try to get you guys to respond to them, um, and try on the next 25 minutes um, be able to really tackle them. But before I do that, I really want to, um, and Baden said this very clearly at the beginning. Uh, you have seen the horror that is happening with our migratory birds all over the world. Uh, we need your help. Um, and I am incredibly grateful to some of the um, uh, 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 three anonymous donors who have been extraordinary helping us match your donation. So if you donate, uh, we can double uh, the impact. Um, so join us help us, uh, these are our warriors on the ground helping us making sure that we stop uh, the illegal killing of birds um, in the flyways. Um, all right, so let's get started with the questions. Um, uh, but end, I'm gonna start with you and it's gonna be uh, one quick question. Um, uh, so, and then I will we'll go into the a lot more meaty uh, questions that we have for the for uh, all of our presenters from the different regions. So Rael is saying, how does BirdLife um, prioritize uh, the illegal killing since we have all of this happening all over the world? How are we pri prioritizing our work? You're muted. There you go. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So actually, it's quite straightforward. So in the BirdLife partnership, the partners are independent. So we work together and collectively we look at the problem. So a part, a large part of the equation is the partner interest to actually work on something. But of course, the foundation of everything is the knowledge. So the thing we're pushing out is trying to get more reviews on the issue out. So we've done our work in, in Europe and uh, Northern Africa and uh, a part of Middle East. Uh, and we start. We have nearly completed the work in uh, Southeast Asia, and we have plans for um, Sub-Saharan Africa. So essentially, and, and as uh, as Brad explained, there's quite a lot of knowledge being collected, especially on the shorebird issue in the Americas. So that's where we have the knowledge. Once we know the importance of the issue, is when the sort of I wouldn't call it negotiations, but it's when the BirdLife partner comes together and review what we collectively want to achieve. If something is a high conservation 
issue, it then automatically sort of lasers within the ranks of our priorities. Another issue to mention is the illegal killing of birds is, is, is not just a local thing. It's not something that can be dealt with only at the national level, but also something that needs to be dealt with at the international level. So there's some variation between flyways, whether there are functional multi-environmental agreements in place. So, so where intergovernmental discussions are taking place. If they are not there, it becomes much more difficult. But we start from the bottom up, so knowledge and partner interest is driving us. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, that's great, Martin. Thank you so much. All right, so let's move on to um, Hong Kong. Um, and uh, I, I've bundled a lot of your questions and I apologize for this. So uh, you get to get yourself because you're going to have to answer a lot of things. The first one for you is about why are people, you know, killing birds to eat them when there's so much more protein available? Um, and if we are replacing the yellow breasted bunting with um, in or we are taking it off the menu is would it be replaced with other birds, putting them also in danger? Okay, uh, well, I think uh, it is uh, it is happening indeed. Uh, from my observation, many young people could recognize the problem, so they don't like to consume the wildlife uh, wildlife meat now. Uh, so the problem will come from uh, our uh, uh, older generation or elderly people because they still they still get this kind of a tradition. Uh, so yes, we 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 could we could still uh, talk to them. We could still teach them, just like the uh, the uh, Mr. Lao, uh, the, the father, uh, the, the father of the of the restaurant uh, who run the restaurant. Uh, yeah, he he is now quitting to eat. Uh, he he quit to eat any more uh, wildlife because yeah, it is influenced by his son. So yeah, education. Uh, we can you can tell the people. Uh, we 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 don't need to consume the uh, wildlife meat as a, a source of protein. So yeah, I'm I'm also believe. Uh, many more better options for the pro of the protein could be available in the market now. So yeah, I think through the education we can do something on it. Okay, so that drives me to the next question for you uh, before I let you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Nigel is saying that I mean he's complimenting your work with restaurant owners, but what about changing the popular culture? And then Asuku is saying, is domestication an option? And then Maria is asking, uh, why has it become so popular in the last 20 years? Is internet contributing to that? Uh, I would say the domestication of a yellow bastard bunting is not an option. Uh, we don't want this to happen because we also have case that uh, uh, domestication means uh, more collecting of the wild individual into the farm. So we don't we don't we don't think it is a good option. And also yes, and now you see uh, eating a chicken. Uh, other poultry uh, could have could could get more protein than just a yellow breast abundance. So we don't see, we we don't see it as an option. But the problem is the people feeling uh, that is uh, they could they can get somehow of a good health or they could get uh, they could enjoy the meal in the season. So this kind of thing we definitely need to uh, teach them through uh, education. Uh, yeah, and then so they appreciate the bunting uh, in that way. But now we could tell them they could also appreciate the bunting in the other way. It means uh, observing them uh, to watch them in the field. So I think, yeah, we, we need to put more effort on the awareness program. Uh, this is what we think, uh, and that we, we we still need to do more because. Uh, uh, people still are not uh, interesting very much on wildlife in, in here, I mean, in, in East Asia. So yeah, we, we, we need to do more. Uh, oh, yes. uh, one more question, is it? Uh, <laughs> I forgot, sorry. <laughs> so it was about uh, um, whether domestication is actually an option. Well, uh, they, it is migratory species. I don't think it is easy to keep in a cage. And also, uh, yeah, uh, they, 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 the people say it usually underestimate the cost of keeping the, the birds in the cage. Yes, I, I, I don't think it is viable. I don't think it is economic uh, uh, viable, actually. Yeah, I agree. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, let's move on to Malta. I will keep saying this, you guys are heroes. And there is a question about, um, with all this intimidation and damage to your property, are you guys protected um, by the state? And also, uh, is there any, 
you spoke a little bit about the international pressure and, and the role that the U uh, European Commission plays, but what about the tourism sector? Okay, um, yeah, interesting questions. Um, but with regards to the, to the um, how do we cope with the emotional part of, of being under stress in certain circumstances, we do pass through a, through a particular training, even the people that go out with us in the field, we make sure that we, we, they are properly prepared for these instances. Of course, nobody is happy with getting their car burnt or anything like that. We do get a lot of support from the community when something like when, when something like this happens. So we never have to rely on the state. Having said that, the state is not necessarily willing to be seen as in supporting us because again of the myth that there is this hunting lobby that would change the government. Um, I think on paper the government is in favor of uh, protecting the laws. I don't think any government would want to actually state it otherwise, and um, because it would make a fool of himself or themselves. Um, but then in reality, we see laws being enacted, which are created for the purpose of smoke screens so that someone can go out hunting for birds, but is disguised as hunting rabbits um, and, and, and a hundred and other things. So um, I would say, yeah, we can cope with the emotional part. We get support from the community. The state is a different story. With regards to tourism, if I'm understanding the question well, from the tourism industry, they support us in the sense that they understand that most of the tourists are not happy to come over to our island and then realize that there's this mess going on. However, we, as a strategic decision and policy from us, we would never um, push for a tourism boycott. We actually want tourists to come over here. We want them to speak to our politicians as well. We want them to speak to the tourism agents. We want them to go back to the country and also write to their MEPs. And so rather than pushing tourism away, which I don't think will work, I think there's a better strategy by getting more tourists over to see what is happening, to help us out, also enjoy the country because there's more than just hunting and trapping, but then also speak up. So we need to engage with tourists for sure, but not in a boycott situation. Yeah, and I will keep saying you guys have been heroes throughout this process and during all this intimidation. Okay. Um, so two more, uh, actually three more for you. Um, has there been any progress on uh, reducing the trapping of more falcons in Malta? And why on earth are we trapping and catching finches? Asks Alexandre Pichesky. Okay, like, like um, exactly what Hong Kong says. They, there is this excuse, in my opinion, of tradition. Uh, I don't think it is necessary tradition. I think tradition is what makes you community or a, or, a, or a person. I don't want to be identified as a Maltese person by saying, ah, we trap finches. I think most of the people don't want to be uh, linked to that. So the reason is tradition. The reason is uh, it's a pastime. It's an enjoyment to have a bird that possibly might sing in the cage for a couple of months and then it dies and then you have to go and trap again. And then, you know, there is a thrill of trapping birds. So it's the only way they think they can see birds. So there is, there is that issue there. Uh, with regards to the Amur falcons, I think it's, there's a bit of a misunderstanding. We do not have Amur falcons in Malta. We don't even have the problem of trapping of falcons. Um, so I think I'm not the right person to answer that about the problem of, of Amur falcons, but definitely we don't have that problem. Great. Thank you. Um, and and um, I'm trying to remember who asked this question, um, but uh, we have done exceptional jobs on uh, the Amur falcon trapping in Nagaland. Uh, so I invite you to go to the BirdLife website and, uh, and, and join our, um, and learn about our fantastic uh, experience there. Okay, one last one for you guys, um, um, Mark and, and Nicholas, um, and then I'll jump into the Americas. Um, we're working with children. We're helping them learn, and, and in similar to Hong Kong, we're with the youth, helping them love birds so they don't eat them. Um, but what about their uncles, their fathers, their brothers, who may be countering all of our communication efforts and our and the propaganda, says John. Um, but also uh, from Asukuo, um, have you engaged the hunters? Okay. Um, yes, we have. We we do we do engage with hunters. Um, definitely with the with the um, lobby of hunters, we do. So the leaders of the hunting groups, we do um, uh, engage with them. I think there are a lot of things which are common 
ground for us, um, such as you know the overdevelopment, the pollution. These are things which even hunters should be against. Um, however, they have recently taken the position of not wanting to do much dialogue unless we stop fighting the end of spring hunting and the end of finch trapping. So uh, the last uh, communication we had was, you know, you give us those for granted forever, and then we will, we will, uh, we can start discussing. So definitely, when it comes to values, you, you do not just let values uh, off the table. So they will remain our will remain flag bearing those those uh, those issues. Um, and with education, it's the same. With children, we have a, a solid program. We work in schools. We have nature reserves, which uh, we have around 6,000 children coming in the nature reserves every year through school visits, except, of course, because of the pandemic. And they actually uh, learn in the nature reserves as part of their curriculum. So it is part of their studies to be in a nature reserve and study something related to biodiversity. Great. All right, let's move on to the Americas now. Um, Brad and Leon, a couple of really interesting questions for you guys, actually. Um, let me start with you, Brad. Peter is asking about the correlation of the reduction of uh, species and the, act, the reduction in active shoot swamps. So basically asking whether the reduction, the reduction that we're seeing in active shooting is a consequence of having less species instead of the measures that we're putting in place for, uh, or, or any other reason. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I haven't heard that really be the reason uh, for Barbados reductions. Uh, there, we did do some survey work in Suriname of hunters, and that was brought up uh, by especially, you know, older uh, hunters that said they didn't feel like there were as many birds around now as there used to be. So in places, I get that is the perspective, but I don't think that's really driving uh, the Barbados change. Okay. And for you, Leon, uh, we saw the decrease um, in, the, in, in the trapping and the uh, killing of birds. Why do you think it's happening? Um, well, one, it's habitat change. Uh, that's, that's, one of, that's one of the things that we've noticed um, when we were doing the surveys. A lot of the areas that was easily accessible by people in those, those communities based on reports of uh, areas um, is now you know, being taken over by a lot of mangrove. Um, and so it's very difficult to get into those areas um, but it's, it's still happening in, in, um, in spots. Yeah. Great. Um, all right. I'm going to circle back to you, Barend, with two very important questions. Um, so a lot of, a lot of the hunting happens by, um, rural communities that don't have other sources of food. Um, what would be the alternatives? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. So, so I, I think I, I personally feel that when hunting is sustainable, it's embedded in the tradition of of people really relying on natural resources. Then there need to be find ways to make it sustainable. But even then, you need to look at whether there are alternatives. So the example that comes to mind is what happened when it was discovered that spoonbill sandpiper was being hunted in uh, in Bangladesh in Myanmar and um, and and it was discovered that actually the people who are hunting the shorebirds there they were not so happy with the hunting issue at all it was sort of their last chance option to gain some proteins in a in a difficult season so what then was done uh, through Banka and, uh, and the Espoonville Sandpiper Task Force was to work with the local communities, whether in return to letting the birds alone and actually supporting the monitoring of the mudflats uh, to develop uh, alternative livelihoods. So developing uh, chicken farms and, and things like that. So that's sort of where I think you need to look at. So it's not per se that hunting, um, you know, you, you should look at it from the perspective of the species that are involved. If the bottom line is that a species has serious troubles because of the hunting that's going on, you need to find alternatives. Um, 
I think that's sort of, um, so I think there are plenty of opportunities. And I think that, that Leon is also a good example of somebody who sort of, I wouldn't say exploit the presence of a huge biodiverse country uh, to make a business. So he, he is guiding people around Guyana and he's doing an excellent job. Even I, I, if I look at the pictures and the reviews, I'm tempted to go there myself. So that's sort of an alternative way to, to in a non-destructive way to use the, the value of biodiversity. We all want to go to Guyana soon. Um, all right, next one. And this, I am going to start with you, Barend, but I do want uh, each of you guys to give me your perspective because it is a massive problem. Um, there are laws and you guys have spoken about laws in many countries. But the big problem, as Marco says it, is the enforcement. So how do we work on the enforcement and what are we doing about um, ensuring that laws are being complied with? So let's start with bad end and then we'll go um, in the same order as you guys spoke. So yeah, Tung, Mark and Nicolas and Brad and Leon. Yes, so what, working with law enforcement, I really like what um, one of the people of the Volta Conservation Foundation said in another meeting, is you don't need to treat government agencies as like big things. <clears throat> Inside those agencies are people. And those people are, are, those are the people you can work with. So yes, they will move from position to position, but the key essence is to find collaborative spirits within those agencies and use that. So there's a lot, a lot of works going on in the Mediterranean actually to raise the capacity and the understanding and the tools that uh, law enforcement uh, agents have to actually tackle the problem. So they're not left feeling helpless um, with the big thing is. So I think there's, there's, we need to think more in, in collaborative spirit. It is of course, uh, as, uh, as, as Mark said, if a, if a government is continuously stretching the boundaries of what's acceptable, then you need to make a stand. But you need to find ways to, within those government structures, to work with it. Because in the end, it's the government structures that need to take responsibility. That's where the sustainability lies. We as NGOs, we can point out the problems, we can help solve it. But in the end, it's the, the, the governments and you know the constituencies that need to decide on the way forward. So I believe a lot we need to invest in that relation. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Uh, yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, well, I, I totally agree with Baron. I think uh, the, the way uh, uh, we need to find a way to coll collaborate uh, with the uh, government. But I also think uh, the other the other thing we could work on it is uh, uh, how to help them as well. Uh, when they lack of information, uh, I mean we can we can provide them, and and this is one way. And also I see uh, bird life is uh, very strong on science and policy. Uh, many government would like to know about uh, the policy. So yeah, I think we could strengthen uh, this aspect to tell them what is the policy, and then use the uh, international platform, something like the uh, CMS, all this kind of the uh, international uh, convention, try to push a government to work on something on it. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Mark? Yeah, definitely I agree on both. Uh, collaboration and also helping with resources, information, and the science behind it. I think there's also another factor with enforcement in every country. The police on its own won't work. and They need input from the people. And we need people to care. And if people care, and that's what we, we, we are trying to do. And the, I think the whole partnership is trying to do. If we get people to care and to pick up the phone when they have a suspicion of something or have seen something wrong, enforcement doesn't need to happen all the time. It just needs to seem that it's happening and you will see a massive reduction. It's like justice. Um, and and this, that's where we need to work hard. On. So true. Uh, Leon or Brad, who wants to take it for the Americas? <laughs> Go ahead, Leon. Do you have something for Guyana? Yeah, um, I think. I mean, we've we've said it all. I mean, um, it's for, for Guyana. There is no protection on the species. Um, so, first approaching the authorities and you know, educating, educating, educating them about you know the importance of you know not allowing these things to happen, and then also um, getting the community more involved um, and those kind of stuff. 
we already have kind of a structure um, as when you speak about the mangrove, uh, mangrove is protected in Guyana and they have rangers that you know, go to these sites and do monitoring. So a good idea would be to incorporate that with the mangrove rangers um, to help you know, with sending out messages and those kind of stuff um, right. when hunting is being um, around in those areas. Thank you, Leon. All right, uh, we are right on time uh, and I'm gonna ask Sarah to put that slide one more time. I want to thank you deeply to all of you who have donated already. Um, and again, to my anonymous donors who had helped us put this um, funding so we can actually match your donation and make the impact of your donation go further. Um, uh, I want to give a very big shout out right now to Irvine who's coming from Virunga National Park um, you guys are the for, at the forefront of this, um, and you guys are helping us ensure that illegal killing doesn't happen, not only of birds, but of all wildlife. Um, and on, we can do this only when you can help us. Uh, when you donate, you are helping the BirdLife family go further, um, be able to work with local communities, work with young people, work with governments, work with the hunters, uh, work with the international pressure, with the tourism sector, with everybody who can help us appreciate the wonder of the migration and keep it going forever and ever. I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, it's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you to my wonderful panelists. Thank you so much for joining us so late and so early in the Americas. Um, uh, Mark, you got it. You got it the sweet spot. <laughs> um, uh, please keep Keep, uh, keep in touch. We are going to have a series of, of webinars about illegal killing throughout this year. Um, we are going to, uh, we're going to have a special uh, year of the Dove as part of a, an effort that we do with our BirdLife partner in Israel with SPNI. Uh, we'll give, be giving you information later on. But this is, this is an important year for us. We want to make sure that we stop the illegal killing of birds and we can do that only with you. So share this information with your friends. Uh, we will make the recording of the webinar available to you guys. Uh, let people know. A lot of people don't know about what is happening. So thanks again for all of your wonderful contributions. Thanks again for being a champion of birds. Thanks again for helping us protect our planet. Uh, we are here for you and uh, we, we hope to see you in our next webinar. Thank you.